Hi, everyone joining the call. I see so many people joining us right now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm here with Bastian Bond, who I feel so fortunate to be doing this webinar with. Um, we're here to talk about the challenge of evil. And we're so grateful you're on the call. And what we'd like to ask you to do right now is just to, in the Q&A, please type in where you're joining us from. I know I'm up here in Northern California and Bastion is actually across the ocean <laughs> in Holland. It's quite amazing that we get to be together to, to share this information with you. So thank you so much. So if you could go to the Q&A, you should see a little box. And yes, there we go. And people will let us know where they're calling from. So let me see if I can see that. Hmm. Okay, and maybe if you can also use the chat, that would be super. There should be a little chat box and it should be able to show me where you all are calling in from. Okay, everybody is sharing and I can't quite see. There we go, there's the chat. I think the chat might work a little bit better for us today. Um, New Hampshire, that's great. Sacramento, Los Angeles. Oh, hello, Michaelmas Press in Massachusetts. Thank you for being on the the call with us today. Yeah, so use the chat instead of the Q&A. That'd be better. Uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, Santa Barbara, California. People from all over Bastion coming. Chestnut Ridge, New York. Loganville, Georgia. Hello, Georgia. Nice to have you on here. Anybody else you can share right in the chat. That's super. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Short Mountain, Tennessee. Uh, Fair Oaks. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and two people from North Carolina, Vermont. Uh, there we go, Montreal, Quebec, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Copic, New York, Spring Valley, New York, um, Ottawa, Canada. So happy to have our Canadian friends here, Denver, Colorado. There we go, Just a few more, San Rafael, California, Palm Bay, Florida. We have a lot of people on the call this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it looks like we have Alabama on the call too. New Hope, Pennsylvania. I'm just gonna read a few more and then we're gonna get started. Anybody else coming in? You can use the chat and we'll use the chat for our questions today too. Okay, well, I'm gonna just take a minute and introduce you, Bastian. I'm just, again, feel so fortunate to be here with you today. Um, this time last year, uh, you were doing a tour, a US tour, um, talking about the topic, the challenge of evil. Um, and someone came up to me in, Fair Oaks, and they might be on the call right now, and said, you should really consider having a webinar on this topic. It's just really amazing the way it's presented. So here we are together a year later, um, and I'm sure people know a little bit about you, but um, I know you are, are part of the Waldorf movement. You've worked in Los Angeles and in Gandhi schools, um, and also, of course, in the Christian community. Um, and we're just so glad you're here with us, and I'm sure you're glad to be in Holland with your 10 grandchildren. Did I get that right, 10? Amazing. Okay, so I'm going to stop now, and um, we're just going to get into, uh, into the webinar, and if you can't see Bastian, you're just going to be able to see him in a minute as soon as I stop talking. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you, everybody. Yes, are we ready? You are ready. <laughs> this morning I got a few uh, emails from the United States uh, and one of them uh, who knew that I had my birthday today uh, greeted me and said, I'm looking forward to your evil. Well, let's see. It's of course a strange thing uh, to give a talk on evil on your birthday. Most people on the special birthday with a zero in it, uh, they go, let's say they go paragliding or they go on an air balloon or so, but I do it in this way. And uh, you see the title, The Challenge of Evil. It's a challenge perhaps or even probably for you and me to speak about evil in a clear way um, and shed light on one could say a dark subject there's a principle that says speak about the good as much as possible speak about evil 
as much as necessary. We will do it in this way. Please don't reverse the order because otherwise you are mixed up eh? when you say speak about the good as much as necessary, speak about the evil as much as possible. I won't recommend to do it this way. We will have three sessions uh, and I hope to make clear to you that we need a special order, a certain order to build up this difficult and rather obscure theme. You saw in the announcement that first of all, this session is about how to know evil. And with knowledge, you think first of all of a certain distance. Yes, first of all, in order to get a view of this being of evil, we need some distance to the theme. It's like a medical doctor who, before he begins to act, uh, makes a diagnosis. So that's my aim for this first meeting, uh, that before we go into something like a therapy, we begin to diagnose what is evil. And therefore we need this faculty of thinking in order to recognize the different forms of evil. You might know from your own experience that without this faculty of thinking, uh, you are often, we are often puzzled by evil or even drawn into the evil before we know it, drawn into the abyss. There's a powerful expression of Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who once said, if you gaze for long into an abyss, the abyss gazes into you. So it's like being sucked into the abyss. And this is one of the ways in which evil works, that it, it takes you in. Therefore, first of all, we need this faculty of beginning to understand. First session. You saw probably that the second session in two weeks has the title Confront Evil. And there we go somewhat nearer, of course, with the confrontation, uh, we are already much nearer than just with this looking at it. Um, in this second session, we will talk about tools, not only tools of knowledge, but also one could say weapons, or we will speak about the armor, a certain armor that one needs for the confrontation. And you will see, we will see that it will not be just about, so to say, evil as something outside us. You remember this expression from one of your presidents who spoke about the axis of evil, something that is far away from my bed. No, evil uh, is confronted, of course, most of all in us. How to deal with the dark sides of ourselves, with what uh, a friend of mine who was on his deathbed once called my dark twin brother. We will talk about the so-called double doppelganger. Uh, and at the end of this session, I would like also to bring a question to you so that we in the next session can share a little bit about these experiences of confronting evil. Wherefore, for which we need the, this first part, knowledge of evil. How can knowledge of evil help us in the confrontation with evil? Third session. There we go in the direction of what, what one could call therapy. 
redemption of evil. Something that for many people seems to be something of the far future. However, we can work here and now to try to begin to redeem evil. Whereas in the second session, we will still meet ev evil as a kind of opposite, even an opposite inside us. In the third session, we will get to know evil more from within. And this brings me to uh, something that is different than the way in which evil is described nowadays often. In uh, the newest literature about evil, you find many, many times evil described as something of the human being, the hum humanity's dark side. There is a new book uh, published this year, The Science Behind Humanity's Dark Side. Julia Shaw, that describes evil just as a psychological experience, an experience of our insight. In this third session, we will see more inside this being of evil that is a spiritual being also. Laura, can you show us uh, the first image uh, i took this image from a dutch painter hannes it has the title confrontation uh, hannes is a modern painter who is called once in a while the modern rembrandt a little bit too much for uh, an, an artist but nevertheless, she paints beautiful artworks. In this artwork, Confrontation, you can see that um, something that is happening in a difficult way between people, we will not yet call it evil, but Confrontation, that's her title, that it is not something between the one and the other, but it fills, so to say, the whole space in a confrontation. You have in your language, I'm a Dutchman, so once in a while you will hear me say words that are not completely in your language. Please, Laura, uh, tell me if something is not yet clear. So in your language you say uh, when uh, someone is uh, very upset, um, when he enters the room, the milk turns sour. Yeah, it shows, the, the, the wording shows in a wonderful way uh, that it doesn't stay with you when you are in a bad mood. It expands in the space around us. With our moods, we can fill the space and attract certain beings. And this understanding we need in order to get to know evil. The first task for the first session. Perhaps we can go back, uh, Laura, to my part. Uh, to the next slide or just to take No, not yet. Yeah, a little bit of introduction for the next slide. Okay. It's a huge task to get to know evil because it usually steps in at a moment that we are not completely awake, completely aware. Evil usually steps in at the moment that we are somehow, somehow, somewhat unconscious or even asleep. Uh, there's um, an artwork uh, of 
the artist Goya, I didn't put it in this series, where you see a man fallen asleep and behind him is a huge, uh, serious, huge row of monsters who step in uh, and the painting is called The Sleep of the Reason Creates Monsters. Here, with this sleep of the reason or the sleep of thinking, the sleep of understanding, we are already in the realm where evil originates. And it is even connected to, one could say, the origin of evil in the history of mankind. Uh, it's not like Goya says, the sleep of the reason creates monsters. The monsters are already there. The being of evil is already there. And it influences us and wants us to get asleep. It's waiting for the moment of an, a dreamlike state. Uh, and in the next slide, we can, we have a visible expression of this sleep-like state or dream-like state in which evil steps in. This is an old relief in the Cathedral of Autun, France, that shows the moment of the fall of mankind. You see Eve, you say Eve, yeah? Um, who is lying amidst the green. She turns her arm back. The, the, the hand doesn't know where it reaches, but you can see a little part of the snake at the very right side of this slide. You see a part of the snake who steps in and then uh, presents the fruit of knowledge to her. A famous expression of the sleep-like sleep state in which the human being is open for evil. Where does evil originate? This is in itself a giant theme. It could be a theme for a whole lecture in itself. Uh, I will only touch a little bit on it because I still want to continue the thread of getting to know evil. But we have to introduce a little bit of this beginning of the existence of evil. I studied uh, dozens of stories, myths of creation of different people, different countries. And I noticed wherever you look uh, in these myths of creation, they all tell about the stepping into existence of evil, not as uh, something that is a, a, an error, so to say, a production error, not an accident, but it's always a deed of the gods. The gods, in whatever mythology you look, are the ones who create, as a conscious deed, evil. God creates his adversary. And the interesting thing, when you look in these uh, myths of creation and look uh, how the so-called evil develops, you can see in the beginning that it's not even an opponent. In the beginning, evil, or now we have to say the evil being, the evil one, is a kind of server of the gods. Someone uh, who uh, stands next to God. Uh, you, do you say a vessel, a vassal, 
yeah someone who serves the gods uh, and that in this case satan we will have to speak about different beings of evil that satan is a create uh, a creation of god you can find in the book of job old testament that begins with the words on a certain day the sons of god came to stand before the lord and one of them was satan what an interesting wording the sons of god satan is one of the creatures of god himself so originally someone who is there even standing before the throne standing before the lord in the course of time and in order to understand this we need something that Rudolf steiner brings he becomes an opponent even the accuser of god the adversary power the rosicrucians called the demons or satan deus inversus the in, you say the inverse god or later people spoke about the devil as god's ape the devil is a, a kind of caricature of god he becomes the opposite how these beings become the opponents of god is again a, a lecture so to say in itself um, there's a, indeed a whole cycle of lectures of Rudolf steiner i will bring a little bit of it in this first talk uh, it's the lecture cycle number 132 in the realities of evolution and here um, there's a remarkable way in which Rudolf Steiner speaks about this origin of the evil one um, first of all to put it in my own word the gods in this case the higher hierarchies reject the offering of certain lower hierarchies they put it away they let them turn away from this original light and these hierarchies that are rejected they form an own group they split apart so to say from the origin and Rudolf Steiner tells why this is needed and here we have a very interesting wording let me read a few sentences my own words show already that this origin of the so-called evil is not evil itself but the higher beings the higher hierarchies that reject something of their offerings now Rudolf Steiner so we see that we must not look for the origin of evil in the so-called evil beings but in the good beings who through their resignation first brought evil about through those beings who were able to bring it into the world and then why do they do this but now the following objection may easily be made i have till now thought more highly of the gods i have always believed them able to give freedom to men without creating the possibility of evil how is it that all these good gods could not produce something like human freedom without bringing evil into the world and then uh, he reminds us 
of a Spanish king uh, who considered the world dreadfully complicated and said, uh, why did God make it so difficult? Can't you make it much simpler? If God had allowed him to create it, he would have made it much simpler. And then Rudersteiner adds, man in his weakness may think that the world might have been made simpler than it is, but the gods knew better. And therefore, they did not leave it to man to create the world. So let us do the work. You human beings are not able to understand this. And then uh, he brings an interesting image and says, we might think that a triangle can be made with just one or two angles. No, impossible. Just like a tri triangle can only be a triangle because it has three angles. So, for in order to develop the possibility of freedom, we need the possibility of evil and of suffering. Here we have the three angles. Freedom is only possible with the possibility for evil. And of course, this causes in many, many cases suffering. These three are needed. So here in this lecture, we have a kind of glimpse in God's kitchen, so to say, where God creates a space, an empty space, where his opposite, where darkness can step in, in order that human freedom can exist. You will find uh, in older and oldest images of evil, all the time expressions of different forms of evil. Laura, can you show us the next image, which is an illustration from a medieval book? And here you will see and recognize something that we can follow in its development, also later in art. In this image, you can see the Christ surrounded by a huge aura. In this aura, he's completely protected. But from all sides, images of evil step in. And you see that they are very different. There are certain snakes who try to attack. They even go with their breath into the outer realm of this aura, although they cannot enter completely. On the other side is a very dark demon who, with a kind of lance or stick, I don't know what, tries to break in. Uh, and these are already different images for different forms of evil. Christ between two images of evil, the snake and the Satan, or as it is called in other uh, languages, the snake Lucifer, the one who is described in the book Genesis, uh, the fall of mankind, and on the other hand, Satan or Ariman, the dark being. Back to the theme, how to know evil. So here we are. One could say completely surrounded by different forms of evil, very complicated to discern who is who, how do they work. Impossible in our time to eradicate. Yeah, so... Um, I think everyone nowadays uh, has to admit 
in our world, we cannot eradicate evil. It's somehow everywhere. It's not, we are not able, so to say, to break evil, to destroy it. There's a nice um, expression of one of the Jewish rabbis, Rabbi Naftali, who once said, I tried to break with evil, but when I did so, I had two evils. You know, you have a stick, you crack it, from one it's two. So it's like that, uh, that it's impossible to get rid of it. However, the difficulty, coming back to our theme of how to know evil, is that we, uh, that we look away from it. That we bring ourselves in this kind of dreamlike state and that we ignore evil. I once saw this happening at the time long ago in the 70s when I was a Waldorf teacher in one of the children of my classroom. Um, I think it was the third grade. Uh, and we went for the first time uh, with our group of children uh, into a medieval drama of the three kings, where, uh, so to say, black and white, good and evil come on stage in the form of, on the one side of the, uh, the stage, the angel, on the other side of the stage, the devil, and in between all these people who are part of this drama. And now this child, uh, who was kind of scared of all forms of evil, looked at, at the stage in a very <laughs> interesting way. I still see her before me. Uh, she put her hand before one eye and where the devil was, she just went like this. So she completely locked away the dark side and she just wanted to focus on the, the good side. It took a few years for her to get to know more of this necessary evil. By the way, that's a book, the title of a book that I would recommend, Necessary Evil written by my colleague Hans-Werner Schroeder. How can we begin to get to know evil? Let's start, so to say, from scratch, from the beginning. Udo Steiner describes an interesting method in fact, not only a method to deal with evil, but uh, he speaks about it in a more broader context, a method to work with anthroposophy. And he uh, puts it in the, in the shortest way that he says, in fact, working practically with anthroposophy is seeing everywhere circumstances of germination in the German language überall keim zustände sehen we see a world that seems to be complete ready fixed but it is possible in each experience to look at what we see in such a way that we try to find what is developing in this being. What is in a, in a state of germination. And let's try now to practice this in relation to evil. The best way to begin to recognize evil is to try to understand, the, to try to recognize it at the moment when it originates. We all know, eh? 
when evil is omnipresent, when it fills, so to say, the whole room, it's very difficult. You are in a kind of zoo surrounded by all the animals. Yeah. But here in the, the, this early stage of germination, where it originates, you are still able to manage, to work with it in a certain way. I will give you one or two examples of this recognition of evil in an early stage. And again, here for, for this, uh, we need something of the insight of Rudolf Steiner. In the year 1923, National Socialism appeared for the first time openly in Munich, in Germany. There was a kind of riot in which National Socialists, the later na Nazis, uh, stepped forward. Uh, and the next day, uh, the papers, the journals all over the world uh, showed what happened in Munich. One of these papers was on a board uh, outside the Goetheanum and people gathered around it. Udo Steiner uh, uh, came and read the announcement and said, when these people come in the government, I cannot enter Germany anymore. And he made his conclusions in this early stage of evil that was germinating. He said uh, to uh, one of his uh, co-workers, Anna Samweber, who described this moment, Anna, go to Berlin uh, and tell the house owner in Berlin, in the Mottstrasse, where he had a house, that we will move out and take everything and bring it to Dornach. Marie Steiner was upset. People did not understand at all why this was necessary. But Rudolf Steiner at that moment was the very first to recognize evil in a state of origin, so to say. Just as uh, in one of the courses that Rudolf Steiner gave before the, for the priests, he announced already in 1924, in the year 1933, humanity will be confronted with the beast, with this darkest form of evil. And indeed, the year 19. 33 was the year in which National Socialism grabbed power and then this unfolding of evil began. Let me um, make his point as clear as possible in a few quotes that Udo Steiner gave and you will find again and again this expression of no evil. Consciousness is needed in order to understand evil. Here, one expression. We can only develop the right resistance against demons. You see, Guru Steiner doesn't speak just about evil, but about beings, demons, by recognizing these forces, that we know that they exist. These forces only become destructive when we remain unconscious about them, when we don't know anything about them. A lecture of January 19, 1915. Evil forces can only keep their power as long as we are not conscious about them. The development of consciousness works for certain evil forces, like the clear day 
for monstrous ghosts. They flee away when consciousness is developed. September 22nd, 1923. In other words, uh, the best way to work, to begin to work with evil is to look at it instead of to run away. When we run away from them, uh, they come, so to say, after us. When we do the opposite, when we confront them with our knowledge, with our understanding, then they run away from us. Therefore, we need this being that we saw in the second image. And I would say the modern expression for this same image is what Rudolf Steiner made. Many of you will be familiar with this uh, sculpture, the representative of the human being, where you have something similar as in the medieval image. Laura, can you show it to us? This third image. So just compare what we saw before. Christ in this middle realm, kind of attacked by the dragon, the snake, and on the other side, the Satan, this dark being. Here we have Christ in the middle, creating a space between two adversary powers, one below him, this dark being of Satan, one above him, Lucifer, and he brings, so to say, order in this chaos by bringing them on their righteous place, I would say. A friend of mine once said about this image, imagine what would happen if you take away this being in the middle. <laughs> so try to use your fantasy <laughs> just to take away this central figure, what would happen in this middle? The two of them would cling together, but even more, my friend who is very much at home in the realm of evil said, there we would find a third form of evil, the Asuras, with their being who is central, Sorat, the one who even wants to extinguish the whole of the human being, the eye of the human being. I won't go into these three different beings. That's again a theme in itself. I want to draw your attention to the one and to this gesture of the one who is creating balance between the two. And here's another expression for how to know and work with evil. In order to begin to work with evil, we need this being in the middle, this being who is in our midst, the Christ. The shortest expression that Rudolf Steiner once used is, a wonderful sentence, in searching for balance is the Christ. He doesn't say in balance is the Christ, because we as human beings are never in complete balance. Yeah? We always have to go back and forth between different uh, forces that pull uh, and push but in searching for balance, the Christ is present.
let us try to make this uh, somewhat more concrete uh, with an experience. A wonderful experience, a one, sorry, a wonderful example of on the one side the technique of evil and on the other side the moral technique to work with evil, to overcome evil, is given by um, a story of Saint Francis. The story tells that Saint Francis, the famous saint, suddenly has a vision of a giant being, a powerful spiritual being, who appears before him in a dazzling light and tells to him in this confrontation, Francis, here I am, Christ. And Francis, who has this feeling of balance, confronts this being by saying, my Lord is humble. Show me your wounds, the stigmata. And at that moment, in a cloud of stench and smoke, Lucifer flees away. Yes, indeed. Lucifer can clothe himself in something Christ-like, which makes it even more difficult to discern these forces. But this story, the story of Francis who meets the counter forces and recognizes the counter forces, repeats itself endlessly. How many times does evil clothe itself in sheep clothes? And nowadays uh, these sheep clothes are very sophisticated and uh, fancy. <laughs> we can uh, not often recognize evil at first sight. One of the people who uh, attended a lecture of me on this theme came to me in the break and said, well, I recognize that something changed in our uh, understanding of evil in the course of a few decades. Uh, when you look at old Western movies, these black-white movies, you indeed recognize a world of black and white, so to say. At first sight, you recognize the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys have nice clothes, they look open and frank, <laughs> and the bad guys, you see already, oh, there's something inside that goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. So literally a black and white world. And look now at uh, modern uh, films uh, and uh, pieces of art. Perhaps only at the end something begins to dawn on us or we are just left with riddles. And indeed that's an expression of how complicated uh, the sheep clothes, so to say, of evil are. We are left in a grey world. Here is a remarkable experience expressed by an expert on evil. I have to insert something that is very radical, but step by step we have to become more and more clear about these forces. In Germany, we have a woman, Ulla von Bernus, who worked for decades in Germany as a Satan's priest. You know, many of you will know that not only we have nowadays priests of a certain religion, a positive religion, but nowadays we have in many of our cities, also in the United States, 
Satan's church and so on, where priests work with black magic. Now this Ulla von Bernus, uh, who, was, who is well known in Germany through many talk shows where she came and uh, interviews that she got, she, she came regularly on television. From one day to the other, she changed from black to white magic. And here is the story that she tells. She told it a few years ago in an interview. A friend of her died. A few days after her death, she was able to meet the person who died and she went with her in imagination through a long corridor until they came in the imagination in an open space. There was twilight, something between night and day. And suddenly in this open space, a rain of grain poured down, a rain of golden grain. And then Christ appeared at the cross and said to him and said to her, in the end, I will conquer. And this very image and these very words made that from one day to the other, Ulla von Bernus became a white magic. Not only, and here's the interesting thing uh, from what I call an expert on evil, not only someone who warned and who warns against all forms of black, black magic, but in this interview she also says, you know, we are not only surrounded here and there by black magic, but what even more penetrates our whole society are all forms of gray magic. Gray magic enters our society uh, and we are flooded by it through the media, through what one could call sweet science, through certain forms of art, certain forms of religion, occultism, addiction, doping, and so on. Here, I let her speak for herself. She says, at the moment, Satan has our planet completely in his grip. From the moment that I changed my spiritual path from black magic to white magic, 90% of my students left. To know about these things is the most important. So here we are back to our theme, know about evil. Knowing about evil, being awake for all forms of evil is in fact the essence of the task, the very first task to become uh, aware of it. I see that the time is going on. I have to, to put away much of my content, I see. Uh, but let me go back to what I promised earlier, uh, something of this lecture cycle, Inner Realities of Evolution. And here is something that I want to bring already in order to prepare for the second and the third session. We might think that uh, just by 
closing the door, so to say, for evil, we can exclude it, as I hope I uh, could express before, it's not possible to exclude it completely. Uh, no, we have to do even more. We have to begin to understand evil, not just from without, but from within. And here's the beginning of this understanding from within. Udo Steiner, in the lecture that I mentioned earlier, in the realities of evolution, describes the nature of the hierarchies. Their nature is to offer. Now, lower hierarchies offer their substance to higher hierarchies. And he describes that this offer is rejected. Now let's try in a human way to understand what happens when you try to bring an offer to someone else and the other person says, no, thank you. I don't want it. Yeah. So it helps in order to understand evil from within and the origin of evil from within to use our human understanding. Imagine my offering is not accepted. Nobody wants me. What's wrong with me? There's no answer. There's just silence from the other side. Of course, I feel when my offer is not accepted, I, I feel rejected, I feel isolated, I am thrown back to myself. And there begins, there's the beginning of this drama that these forces, these hierarchies, begin to turn away from the light. They begin to make a distance. The distance is already there, but they cut themselves off from these higher beings. They hide their own treasures. And this is uh, what one could call in the giant picture the beginning of cosmic alienation. This cosmic alienation, dark beings who turn against these higher beings, who do not accept their offering, this is also the beginning of human alienation, the so-called fall of mankind. But, and that's in this drama, so to say, the positive side, the, all of this is necessary in order to make us human beings free. We are no more by falling away from the Godhead, uh, puppets on the string of God. We are no more moral robots, but we begin with our freedom. As uh, Schiller the German poet put it, the fall of mankind, the most blissful hour of humanity. It's not just tragic, it's an absolute necessity to develop freedom. Well, uh, with this, at least there's a beginning, so to say, of our theme. I'm very much aware that there are some strings that I just put out and that can be followed endlessly. Uh, we will need certainly the three sessions in order to make the strings to a tapestry that is more woven together. But I will try to pick up these threads and develop them further in the next session. I hope that it's at least my um, intention of this first meeting that uh, 
each time when there is an outburst of evil and when we begin to complain, why did God make it so difficult? Can't we do it somewhat easier that this image uh, also pops up, so to say, in your thoughts, necessary evil? Laura, I think our time is already nearly up, or? Yes, wow, Bastian, thank you so much for this incredible time together. There's so much to think about and process. Um, and I keep you know, thinking about this country in particular and some of the things that have happened here and then, and then all the way down to my own you know, bring, bringing the sour milk into my own kitchen um, <laughs> <laughs> with my own way of being sometimes. Um, and I'm really looking forward to exploring this more with you. So uh, just, a, just a, yeah, people are asking if there's a possibility of questions now. Um, and I would say uh, we can probably have a few questions now. And then I would encourage people to email me the question and yes. I can pass, pass it on to you. Um, for those of you getting off the call, thank you so much for being with us. And um, we have lots of people wishing you happy birthday today, Bastian. A very mm -hmm. special day and what a thing to do on your birthday. Um, so yes, I think um, if, if anybody wants to ask a few questions now, we, we can stay on for the next five minutes or so. So why don't we go into that yes. and um, we'll have this time together in, in two weeks again to move on to the next. If people uh, ask questions after that I'm happy to bring them in in the next session too yeah great so you can email me and I think pretty much everyone has my email but it's laura at anthroposophy.org so as long as you can spell anthroposophy you should be able to reach me it's laura at anthroposophy.org um, and you can email me there so if anybody wants to share in the chat I'm going to stop sharing the um, slides right now um, and then there we go. Okay, can you say that the author of the book Necessary Evil? That's one of the questions we have. Hans Werner Schröder. But Laura, I made a list of references and there you will find it. Perfect. And yeah. everyone will get that along with the slides. So they'll get that Oops. in this recording. Super. Yeah. Anybody else have questions they want to ask now? I think. Okay, so here's one. Um, okay, so we have a question that's saying that first, happy birthday. And then Steiner says there is a mystery of the new ISIS hidden in the representative of man. And I, I think, you know, the question is what is the role of ISIS in the sculpture? And is there a connection to the topic that we're talking about? Do you have a sense of that? Um, or we can talk about that, you know, via email too. As far as I understand, it's not immediately connected to the theme of evil, mm -hmm. the new ISIS. Um, another hour, <laughs> yes. another talk is needed in order to bring this together with the theme of evil. But uh, it's not directly connected to the theme of evil, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I uh, so. A huge theme in itself. You know, there's a lecture uh, that has the title, The New Isis. There you might find, find some connections, but for now it's a, a theme in itself, too much to go into it. Yes, and if you want to email me about that, we will be taking up this topic over the next year or so. Um, the Divine Feminine and Sophia and Isis that's something that the society will be bringing um, yeah. over the next year or so. So, okay. And then one more question. We'll just do one more. Uh, were you going to say something else, Sebastian? I'm sorry. Yes, at the end, I will say something. Okay, that's great. Um, can you speak a bit more about the painting of the confrontation? The person didn't really see the confrontation in there. I can probably pull it back up. Uh, so if you give me one second. Yeah. Uh, sorry, everybody's going to see something a little funny for a second. Here we go. So here. There it is. It's a huge painting. 
um, something like one by one meter. Sorry, I don't know your... It's big. <laughs> yeah, it's big. At the left, you can see the silhouette of a person. When you look more clearly at the right side, there also might be something of a silhouette of another person. Then a shadow. In the back, other, well, are these persons, are these beings? I don't know, but it might be that there are a few more, just uh, a beginning of an image. But then you see between the two at the left and at the right side, these two dark images, um, the forms uh, going toward each other, meeting somewhere at the top, going down. Mm. And forces that, so to say, are connected to each other. There's not just at the left side one person, at the right side one person. There's evidently between them something that one could say brings them together, but also something that confronts them. As said, the title of the painting is Confrontation. So in this very open image, which doesn't give a clear picture, it's a kind of riddle picture. It shows that between two forces, something is working in between. And therefore, I use this painting to show that when we are confronted with something or someone, this confrontation is not just in me and in the other person, but between us, and it creates an atmosphere. This atmosphere is the realm in which certain beings, evil beings, can step or in a positive confrontation, we will talk about confronting conflict of Glassel, who works in a positive way with it. It can be the space in which uh, light beings enter. Beautiful. But for now, I guess our time is up. I think it is. Yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> let, let me ask one question to all of you. So the question about knowledge insight for our next meeting, which is about confrontation with evil, it might be a helpful question if you want to think about it. How are you helped by insight? How are you helped by knowledge? Did you find, so to say, tools, weapons with which you could work? So we will attach the theme of confronting evil with the theme no, to know evil. How are you helped with this insight and knowledge? With this, we will start then in two weeks. In two weeks. Thank you so much, and I hope the rest of your day is wonderful, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'll make sure I send that question out to everyone, along with the recording and the slides. So thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you very soon. Thank you, Bastian. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you.